Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Sean Almer. I'm Executive Director at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. I want to thank you for joining me uh, for another in our series of monthly programs called One Night Stands. And this is where we look at one work by one artist um, uh, for one night. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at a work that is currently on view in our Built This Way Architecture in Art uh, exhibition. And it is a, uh, a painting. Um, that uh, I have admired for some time uh, now and really haven't spent a lot of time digging down into it um, um, or the artist, you know, um, just some things on the surface. So this gave me a nice opportunity um, to look a little bit uh, deeper. And uh, for those of you who have um, joined us before, you know, this is a shorter program. Um, we're looking to, you know, sort of do a little presentation for about 20 minutes and then allow about 10 minutes um, for, for Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, you know, uh, jot them down as we go along and I'll see if I can't uh, answer them. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, give that a second. All right, excellent. And here, let's see. start that there so it's more full screen. So tonight we're going to look at Oliver Dennett Grover's San Pietro di Castello. Um, and here um, is the painting itself. And as I said, it is currently on view um, at the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art in our, exhi in our exhibition Built This Way, which is an exhibition of um, paintings and drawings and prints uh, that are, uh, and watercolors that are all drawn from our permanent collection in which um, we have two-dimensional artists um, looking at the three-dimensional art form of architecture. At one time, um, back in the Renaissance, uh, if you were an artist, you were also an architect and a draftsman and a painter and a printmaker and, and, uh, and so forth. You did all these things. But over time, those disciplines all became separated. Um, and so our curator, Kay Kunal, um, pulled this exhibition together uh, looking, you know, uh, at two-dimensional artists who were picturing the three-dimensional world. Um, and it would be interesting to take a look at architecture through painter's eyes. So this is um, one of the paintings um, in the exhibition. It's much more rewarding in person, and I certainly invite you to come see it. Um, it dates from around uh, 1914. It's a, it's an oil on canvas. It's a larger-ish work. I mean, it's about, about 24 by 30 inches. Um, and has this wonderful period frame um, from, from the time period. This is one of the earlier uh, items that joined our collection. This came to us in 1915. Um, and you can tell that when you look at caption. In the caption, you see that it says 15.4. Uh, this is a piece that came to us in 1915, and it was the fourth item that came to us that year. And that is how accession numbers uh, frequently are. Now that we are in the 2000s, um, we don't just use two digits. So, you know, if we, if we had acquired it this year, it would be 2023 dot and then whatever uh, number it is. So this came to us in 1915. It's not a precisely dated work, but we know it must date from before that period in time. And looking stylistically at the work, um, it does fit in that kind of uh, early teens uh, uh, for, for this particular artist. Now, Got a much closer view of the painting here. Um, it is this wonderful sort of luminous painting uh, with kind of this creamy colored um, church, San Pietro di Castello, um, in uh, uh, the fronted by water um, with some other architecture around. It is a painting of the church of San Pietro di Castello in Venice, Italy. And the water is uh, one of the many canals that you see in Venice. We'll talk uh, more specifically about where um, this is located in, in a little bit. Um, but we are fortunate because it is on view that we can get some wonderful detailed shots um, of it. And you can see that uh, at this point in time, um, the artist is, is, is very loose with his brushwork. And he's really creating a kind of impressionistic work. Uh, he is an American painter, and I'll go into his biography in a bit, but he's an American painter. And, um, and in the teens um, uh, in America, Impressionism was still the predominant style. Now, um, that, of course, began in France and began in the 1870s um, and reached its popularity in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, and by the turn of the century, new styles were entering in France. 
Um, you've got Picasso arriving on the scene and so forth. And while there were still plenty of painters who were still painting in an impressionistic manner, um, new things were happening in Europe. American painters, um, uh, having traveled over abroad in, in the uh, 80s, the 90s, and, and in the arts, they were very much taken by Impressionism. And collectors in the United States were very much interested in, uh, in Impressionism. And so that was the predominant style in America. And it lasted longer in America um, than it did in Europe. And here we see an American artist working in the teens. You can see how loose his brushwork is. He's not doing the small, short flecks and daubs of color that some of the Impressionists are, are well known for, um, but you can see that his brushwork is still, nonetheless, is very, very loose. Um, and you can see him pushing the paint around. What's really remarkable in looking at this reflection um, is that, you know, the, the water really isn't blue. The water is really a reflection of the colors that are above the water surface. Um, yeah, there are a few strokes of, of blue pigment here, but it's um, you know, really, uh, a, really a reflection, a glassy surface that is the reflection um, of, of what, what is above. Here, another detail um, of some of the boats that are along the edge of the canal and the people who are working in those boats, they are, you know, they are um, very much tied to, to the sea. Again, you can see how he is it, very loosely applying um, this pigment, um, how, you know, he squiggles that um, down to give you the sense of the ripples um, that, one, um, that one sees in a reflection that where the water's being moved by the wind. Um, or here you begin to see um, a little bit, you see how very, very general the figures and the boats have been put in. Um, you can see, uh, really, if you look closely, you can see the weave of the canvas um, in the facade of the, of the church um, behind them. You can actually see the weave. So it's not a super thickly painted um, uh, painting. It is thick in parts. It's thick where he's really moving some of that paint around, and we'll see some details here. Um, but he's really just giving us the impression of figures at work uh, on the boats. Um, and here, in a very, very uh, close-up detail, uh, uh, those same figures. Um, and again, you can really see the texture of the paint, and you can also see the texture of the canvas upon which the paint has been laid. Here, a little bit of the architecture and the sail of one of the boats to the right-hand side. And you can see he's also using that same very loose brushwork um, in this section as well. Here, a really terrific detail where you can see it is thick in parts where he's piled on that paint and he's moving it around with the brush. Um, but it's really a remarkable detail. It gets you up closer, probably closer than you can see it. And it's all the more remarkable when we look at these details, when you consider these, all of these shots were made um, through glass. Uh, the painting is um, behind glass. Um, and so that's oftentimes makes it, makes it very, very difficult to shoot um, good images of. And this is a remarkable um, detail um, uh, over the, the central portal. Uh, or maybe one of the side portals, I should say, um, where you can see how he's pushing that paint around. Here, architecture to the side. These are the domestic buildings that are to one side of San Pietro. Um, and you can see they are just very, very generally and very loosely laid in um, by the artist. Um, as you recall, when I showed you the overall shot, it all read perfectly fine. But when you go in deep, when you start looking very, very closely, it all sort of dissolves. Um, here, another view um, of, uh, of the domestic architecture to the left-hand side of the composition. Um, and here, much closer um, detail uh, of the work. And again, you can totally see how he is moving, moving that pigment around. Uh, um, he certainly, at this point in his career, um, uh, quite... Uh, su uh, successful. Um, he's quite um, skilled. He's able to move this paint around with a, a sense of assuredness, um, and it reads reads perfectly well. Uh, uh, it's it's um, uh, not the kind of timid strokes that you might find um, with a beginner. Um, this is uh, an artist who's been uh, working with oil paint on canvas for years at this point. He knows what he can do with it. He knows how it can, even with a somewhat aggressive brushstroke, still communicate the form behind it. 
here uh, another detail. Look how he just simply puts in the windows um, and the doors in this piece of domestic architecture. They're just very, very generally laid down. And it totally reads from a distance, but it's when you get closer to it that it that it dissolves away. Or her, here, the, the church facade, the pediment, of, of the facade, you can see here um, in the very center with the X, those would be um, uh, the key forms. The crossed keys are a symbol of, uh, of St. Peter, St. Pietro. Um, and so um, they uh, are on the facade um, of, of the church. You can see they're just generally laid down, um, but again, it totally reads um, when you are from a distance. Here, another view of that same section, you can see how he, you know, there's there's a, a cupping, a little bit of cupping um, to the edges of some of those brush strokes where they actually have three dimensions. They actually, in the right light, will cast shadows. Um, uh, but by and large, the, uh, the whole composition is rather thinly painted. Um, he's an artist who really, you know, kind of knows his stuff, knows how to work his way um, through, through a canvas. Uh, and here, um, again, is the overall sh shot. So when you stand away from it, you know, it, it all, all those little brush strokes coalesce. Um, they take on form. They become um, uh, firmer. Uh, and, and it reads as a very successful uh, composition. Uh, you can, all the parts sort of come together. But it's when you go in really close that you see all of that dissolve into individual brush strokes. He knows, you know, where the viewer will be standing. Uh, and he's dealing with a lot of interesting surfaces. Uh, he's got the sky. He's got the forms of the architecture themselves. He's got the, the, the kind of um, uh, diaphanous forms of the sail. Um, and he's got those wonderful ripples and the reflection um, in the foreground. So this is uh, San Pietro di Castello in, um, in Venice. And this doesn't look anything like the painting. And that's because we're looking at the church from behind. Um, this is the back end. This is the apse end, which is where the altar would be, that rounded form that you see right sort of dead center, um, uh, just to the just to the right of the uh, of the campanile, the bell tower that you see there. Um, and he's actually portraying it from the other side uh, of the dome, if you will, this side. So you see the cupola of the dome in the background of, or at the or at the very top. Um, but this is the facade. So while the church, I'm going to go back here. Is really made is really a brick structure, um, and these wonderful rosy colored bricks that you see here, and a lot of what you see um, in Venice are these wonderful rose colored bricks. It gives the whole city a kind of a feel, kind of a pinkish hue, if you will. Um, you know, the most important part, the facade, uh, they've done here in 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 a white stone, probably marble, um, and it's a very grand facade. Uh, you can see you can see the crossed keys of St. Peter up above in the pediment. Um, you can see all those wonderful little dentals, the little the little squares that you see uh, that surround the pediment on a, a most of the uh, most of the forms. You see the swags um, that are carved in there. And, and you get a sense of scale because you see um, the doorway open at the very center. Um, and that would be a human sized doorway. So it really is a majestic and grand um, uh, uh, edifice. Uh, and here I've put the two together um, so that you can have a, a sense of, you know, how faithful um, um, Grover is um, to, to the actual work. And you see the domestic architecture to one side is still there. And of course, now, now there's more shutters and awnings and so forth. But those gables, um, uh, those uh, dormers that you see up on the top, they're still all there. Um, and architecture in Venice has not changed greatly um, since um, uh, Gro Grover's time. Um, and so that's still very, very faithful. Now, obviously, trees and bushes have grown up. Um, those are changes. Um, and it, but it is sort of striking odd because you see here in front of in front of the actual photograph of San Pietro, uh, you got this wonderful little lawn. But then uh, from Grover's painting, it's all water. Uh, and that's partly because if you step back further, if you get onto the bridge that connects um, Venice proper with this island, um, you can see that there is water in front. Um, just from, from Grover's point of view, from his angle and his composition, you, you don't hardly see the lawn at all. All you see is the water and the boats in the front of, uh, of the church. And so as you 
get further away, you can see where Grover is. He's almost as if he's in the water painting this scene. Um, actually, he's probably on the opposite bank and, and looking across the water um, to, uh, to this church. Um, and from his vantage point, which is sort of at water's edge, you don't see the green of the lawn that is in front of the church. And he was not the first artist to paint um, San Pietro. This is uh, Canaletto, who was famous, uh, famous Venetian um, uh, artist um, who painted many images of Venice. Um, this is one that, um, that he did um, from the 1730s. It's in the National Gallery in London um, currently. Uh, and, um, and you can see very much the same vantage point um, uh, as the last photograph uh, of, the, of the church. Um, and here a little bit less, uh, um, a little bit less domestic architecture, um, but uh, nonetheless, um, it's you know, it's grown up. And by the time Grover um, paints the scene, uh, but uh, uh, but it is a a noteworthy church in Venice, um, not the most commonly visited one. There's lots and lots of churches in Venice, um, but this is one that is picturesque because of due to its placement uh, up against the water. So where is it? So we're taking an, a, an aerial view of it. And what you see dead center um, is the Basilica of San Pietro di Castello. And this is the rounded end that we saw in that first image I, I showed you. And this is the facade that you see here. So you can't really make it out because you're looking directly down on it. And so in all likelihood, Grover's over here, um, uh, opposite this very small channel. And this channel is much smaller than you see in, in Canaletto's um, painting. Uh, Canaletto made it seem as if this waterway was vast, um, but it's, it's not, it's, it's not very deep at all. But, but, but Grover's probably over here um, uh, doing, doing the, getting the sketching for this composition. In all likelihood, uh, a painting of this size he would have painted in the studio, um, but he would have probably made a sketch or, a, uh, or, or an oil uh, sketch study um, in, um, uh, at, on the scene and, and brought it back to the studio where you could work, work on a larger scale. If we pull out a little bit, uh, the San Pietro is here um, where the red, the red dots are over here. And over here is the, really the heart of Venice. This is where San Marco is. This is St. Mark's. Um, this is the Piazza San Marco right here. Um, train stations over here. Uh, you, you hop on a Vaporetto and it takes you down the Grand Canal here um, and you, know, you can get off many different places here, but this is the place where most many people get off, which is the Piazza San Marco. So um, over here is a different part of Venice. This is a much more residential section. Um, and, and while uh, uh, these all look like roads and streets, they're actually um, passageways. They're actually paths. Um, so it really is not uh, a, a long walk, um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a walk, um, very picturesque bit of a walk um, uh, to get to to uh, San Pietro, very, very doable. Um, over here um, are the, the Biennale Gardens. Every two years, Venice holds a Biennale for the arts. Um, and this is where that is held. It's a very, very big art fair. It's been going on for many, many years, and has also taken over several other buildings in town when that's the when that's the case. But this is where um, where the basilica that um, Grover paints is um, in relationship to the overall uh, sort of layout um, of of Venice. Um, so, who was Oliver uh, Denon Grover? Uh, here you see a photograph of him. Um, he was born in 1861 in Earlville, Illinois. Um, and uh, his father was a lawyer, a very famous lawyer, um, and was a, uh, a, an active member of helping slaves escape on uh, the Underground Railroad to Canada, uh, and his father was, and, and um, became very well known for, um, for civil rights as a lawyer. Uh, uh, the Grover family uh, moved to Cleveland while Oliver was still a boy. Um, and he took a few um, uh, classes uh, as a, you know, as a, as a young, well, as, a, as a student, as a boy still, um, from, uh, from some uh, artists, um, but focusing primarily on, on portraiture. 
Um, he does study initially at the Chicago Academy of Design, which was the school, was the precursor to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. The Art Institute of Chicago wasn't um, really conformed yet. Um, but he did study law at the University of Chicago, um, no doubt because his father was a lawyer and he would probably somewhat presume that he would follow his father into the legal profession. Um, but so he did study law at the University of Chicago, but then in 1879, so he's still a young man, he's 18 years old, um, he takes a little bit of uh, bequest money that he had received and he goes to Munich and uh, he studies at the Royal Academy in Munich under the artist Frank Duvenek, who is an American artist who's, who's over um, in Munich at the school. Uh, and uh, at that time, um, before the Parisian schools uh, took off, most American artists went to German schools um, to study when they were able to go abroad and study. So uh, he went to the Royal Academy um, in Munich um, in 1879, um, and he followed Duvenek uh, when Duvenek uh, went to Venice um, and to um, Florence. Um, so he followed, stayed kind of with him. They, they became great friends and he learned a great deal from, from, from Duvenek. Um, then um, uh, after his time with Duvenek, he goes to Paris and he studies at the Academy Julienne um, in uh, between 1883 and 1885. The Academy Julienne, of course, is the same school that Grant Wood was to study in uh, much later in 1923, 24. Um, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a French school that had been around for a long time. Um, at that time, he was no doubt studying Impressionism uh, because that would have been the prevailing style in the 80s and would have been taught at the Academy Julienne. He comes back um, to uh, Chicago um, in, uh, here's a, a little bit older portrait uh, of him. He comes back to Chicago um, in 1885 um, at, the, at the close of his time at the Academy Julien, um, and he begins uh, his career as an instructor um, at the newly formed Art Institute of Chicago, um, where he is a teacher there for, for five years. Um, but in the midst of that, uh, in 1891, he said enough of Chicago winters, he goes back to Venice, um, there's a lovely little article uh, uh, that quotes, you know, he had had enough of, of winter in Chicago. He was going to go um, go back to, to Venice for the winter. Um, and he comes back in 1892 um, and, uh, and paints this work, um, Thy Will Be Done, which is a large work. It's a 70 inch work. Um, and uh, it uh, actually received the Charles uh, Tyson Yerkes Prize. Um, it's a, uh, a painting of a woman um, who's received um, some sort of disturbing news. The, the envelope is on the ground. The letter's crumpled in her hand. Uh, her other hand is up uh, to her chest, and, and she's looking heavenward, um, and the title is Thy Will Be Done. It was very well received um, and uh, in, in Chicago. Like I said, it won an award um, uh, right away. Uh, and and it's very typical of work that that uh, Grover is doing in the 90s, um, which tends to be a bit of a portraiture. So here, uh, another portrait um, from uh, a little bit later, um, and uh, a very and you can see he's very accomplished um, in in his portraiture. Um, and here, uh, not from just a couple years later, is the harem girl or the harem scene. Um, and, and this is very much um, sort of in keeping with the wave of Orientalism. Um, there's a movement in the late 19th century called Orientalism. There was a fascination um, with uh, the, the Middle East. Um, and, um, and so many artists um, uh, created images. Um, Jerome, for example, Jean -Leon, uh, Jerome is one artist in France who's doing this, um, but it, it finds its way over to the United States as well. And here we see Grover um, doing it again, a figurative work. Um, there are elements of painterliness in this, but on the whole it's very controlled um, uh, in the same way that they will be done and, 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 the, and the portrait um, are also somewhat, somewhat controlled. This kind of uh, image is a little bit looser um, uh, this is from a little bit later. This is from around 1915. And here you see much more of the impressionistic vein going on. It's still a figure, 
um, but there's much more of the landscape um, and it's very feathery. There's a lot of loose brushwork. Um, you know, he's really very confident in his in his abilities and his ability to communicate with uh, with loose brushwork. Um, and this kind of garden or landscape theme, theme, these are the kinds of things that he becomes well known for. Um, portraiture is really sort of more, and figurative work tends to be earlier um, in his career. He doesn't abandon figures because we have figures in, in our piece in San Pietro, but they they take on a much more uh, insignificant role. Um, it really becomes about landscape or, or cityscapes um, in the case. And here, here's a good case in point. Um, from 1903. So, so shortly after he does things like the harem scene, um, he he really sort of gets in deeper and deeper into landscape. Here, here are kind of garden scene. This is a very controlled landscape. This is a, a, a cultivated landscape. And you can see again, very uh, loose, not as loose as he will be later, um, but it is uh, a fairly loose work um, and, and a devoid in this case, devoid of human figures. And it's all about light and shadow and the flicker of light across surfaces, which is really um, um, the core of what Impressionism is about. Here, um, from a little bit earlier, not quite as, as, as vibrant, vibrant, but different kind of scene, um, different kind of light, I guess, is from Eagle's Nest. It's kind of, again, a figureless um, uh, landscape really uh, really about the um, about the landscape. This is small. This is nine by 12 inches. This very well could have been a kind of study for him, uh, although he did sign and date it. Um, so he felt it was very finished and accomplished. Um, but given its small size, I could see it being a model for a larger painting if he so chose um, to do it. But again, you can see here, even in 1902, you get the visible brushwork. You can see the brush strokes that one finds um, in, in later and larger compositions. Um, he's not afraid to let those brush strokes be seen. Here from 1913 um, uh, is, a, is a much larger canvas, almost four feet uh, in, in width. Um, this is one that is in the Art Institute of Chicago's collection. Um, this is like Orta, which is in uh, Northern Italy. Um, and you can see again, it's sort of uh, kind of an expansive view, just like the last one we looked at, um, where you get a lot of landscape in this. This is not those small enclosed secret gardens. This is much broader um, with, with uh, architecture throughout, but, um, but really is about the great expanse um, of, of the land. But it really was Venice that it kept going back to time and time again. Um, he seemed to be quite at home there. He makes several trips to Venice. Um, and initially, in some of the earlier works, he's really interested in the day-to-day -day life in Venice. So here's a market scene. Um, again, it's very figural. It is painterly, but not so much so that you can't make out all of the details. Uh, and, and it's a fairly large work. Um, it's just a genre scene. It's just a scene of everyday life that you that you might encounter if you were in 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 Venice. Um, and it's just you know fascinating. It's not a grand uh, edifice like San Pietro. It's it's not a, a great site, um, but it's it's just sort of everyday life um, um, in in Venice. Here too, from a little bit later. Um, from 1908, this is the wedding day near the Rialto Bridge, which is that bridge you see in the background there, that arched bridge over um, over the Grand Canal um, is the Rialto. So there's a little wedding scene, um, and you can just barely make out the bride um, in this composition, as you see next standing next to the, the gondolier um, there. And um, and again, it's it's really the figures are there, but they're not. They're not the focus. Um, it may be part of the title, but it's really this sort of expansive cityscape um, that um, that Grover is interested in. Or here near the Rialto, and again, you see the bridge, the Rialto Bridge in the background. You don't see all of it, you just see half of it. It's cut off um, by, um, by, the, by the building, by where the, the artist stands. Again, he's very interested in light um, and the light on surfaces. Uh, you got the light, um, you got wonderful shadows cast by the figures. Um, and I've got a little bit larger. I showed you this one because I wanted you to see the beautiful frame that it's in, the very beautiful original frame that it's in. Um, but a larger larger view of the same composition. Um, you can see that there are figures in here, but they're not really the focus 
uh, of the composition. It really is this expansive view of Venice, um, the boats, the, the the rippling water, and the water is 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 really kind of constantly moving um, in the canals in Venice um, for the most part um, because there's so much boat traffic. Um, if you know there are no cars, there are no roads per se. Um, there are these walking paths that you see here and lots and lots of bridges to get across the canal or sometimes you can cross the canal in a boat um, and and there's boats that run the length of the canal but there's also lots of boats that run across the canal to get you from one side to the other if you don't want to walk all the way down to where there might be a bridge so um so there's the water's choppy choppy because it's getting a lot of activity and that's just you know i'm talking about just people activity um if you you know if you make your living um, uh, by boat. Um, that's also happening um, in the canal. So the water does tend to be very uh, choppy. Here, the Red Palace, um, which is one of the many buildings um, in Venice. It's not as expansive um, uh, as the, the last couple of examples I've shown you, um, but it dates very close to the in date to our painting. Um, and again, you can see his fascination with ripples and the way in which he's put those ripples down is very much in keeping um, with um, the style that he utilized in our painting, which helps us, I think, very, uh, very much to sort of uh, uh, lock in that, that approximate date um, for our painting to around 1914. Um, here, again, one of the many um, uh, edifices in in Venice. Um, you know, it is it red. He's got very red brick. Um, it makes a wonderfully red reflection um, in the canal. You see one of the many bridges that cross um, over that canal. And oftentimes you only have a tiny little walkway along the edge of the canal. And sometimes that even disappears. Uh, some of these buildings go right up to water's edge. Um, and the pathway isn't along the water, but it has to cut through, cut through the city. Here from uh, the same year, even looser, um, is a view of uh, the Piazza San Marco. This is sort of really the heart of Venice, if you will. Um, it's a large open uh, piazza or plaza. Um, and on one end of it, it is, it is fronted by um, St. Mark's uh, San Marco, um, which is the, the, really the largest church um, and, and the most important church in many ways um, for the history of Venice. Uh, and uh, and here you can see uh, you get a sense of its majesty of its grandeur um, and and the smallness of the figures as you get closer to the facade of the church um, but and the figures that are here are just just ever so loosely put down um, they're just they're sort of daubs of paint basically very similar to the way our figures are are put down in in San Pietro um, and again very interested in light shadow, the flicker of light, the way, you know, the, the, the light, you know, illuminates, um, but also with the realization that in a moment, um, the lighting can change, things can change. And so um, that's the whole part of the impressionism movement is that uh, the understanding that, that light is, is fleeting, it's momentary. Um, you're only going to capture in one brief moment an impression, a brief impression, knowing that it will change uh, with uh, it, it, in a moment's notice, it will change. And here from a little bit later in this career from after times, you see a very, very expansive view um, of, of Venice. And this certainly does not uh, represent all of the, um, of the Venetian works that he created. These are just some of them that kind of give you a sense of that, of that breadth of, of work that he did um, uh, that, um, you know, was really, a, focus on one of his favorite places, um, Venice. Now, he's also known, uh, in addition to being a, a painter of, of landscapes of Italy, and Venice in particular, um, he's also known as the painter of, of the American West. Um, he would go out um, to the West Coast and paint out there uh, as well. Um, so um, he really became known particularly for his landscapes, um, both European and American landscapes um, throughout the, the majority uh, of, of his career. Um, and uh, as I said, he, he uh, lands on the scene pretty early. Um, he's fairly well recognized by the time he's 30. And then, you know, for the rest of his career, he's teaching, making work, selling work. Um, he becomes, along with a few other artists, quite, the, quite a force in Chicago, um, kind of a tastemaker, uh, if you will, and, um, uh, and, and really sort of uses Chicago as his home base 
um, for for his, the entirety of his of his life. But um, but you know he always kind of keeps seeming to come back to Chicago. Um, but that did not prevent him from traveling um, uh, everywhere and and capturing what he saw um, in these paintings that that had a had an eager market. Uh, that there was a there was he had a good clientele who were interested um, in images of, of of Europe, in particular of Italy and Venice, but also of of the American West, um, where they don't normally get to go or see um, from their sitting rooms in Chicago, but can enjoy um, by way of, uh, of of Grover's painting. So I'm going to stop sharing here and come back and see if if anyone has any questions it went a little bit long um as i guess i usually do uh but uh, uh see if anybody has any questions about um our painting san pietro di castello um and and or how it fits into into um grover's uh career Okay, well, if there are no questions, I thank you for joining me um, today. Uh, we will be doing, again, a, a one-night stand um, next month as well. Got lots of things happening, uh, lots of uh, programs happening um, yeah, this spring. Uh, we're kind of seeing an explosion of programs. So some are virtual by Zoom, but many are in person. So um, I invite you to join us wherever and whenever you can. Um, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much for coming.